G'day and welcome back to Australia's best classic mini YouTube channel, Tomo's Tune-Ups. On this episode, we are gonna be back on the 1275 engine, and I'm gonna show you how to start an engine that either hasn't run for a very long time, or one that has been freshly rebuilt. So we are just over two and a half weeks into winter here at Australia and it has been absolutely freezing. We've had some really low single figures and hence the cup of coffee. So let's have a bit of a talk about this. What do we need to do to be able to start an engine that hasn't run for quite some time? Or in our case, one that we've been freshly rebuilding. So you obviously have the option to put it back in the car and fire it up, connect everything, away you go. So you're probably wondering, how is it that you can get an engine to start on an engine stand, a crate, um, in a movie, or even in a show like Roadkill Garage, for instance, and where they go and find a barn find, and then they put a bit of fuel down there, then they drive it 500 miles across the planet, and then they, you know, have the thing running like it's, you know, made for it without any complications. So pretty simple answer. Air, fuel, spark. Those are the three things an internal combustion engine need to run. So we're gonna go through each one of those things as well as what you're gonna to need to be able to fire up an engine that hasn't started for a while, or in our terms, has been freshly rebuilt. All right, so step number one. What we need to do is turn the engine over by hand to make sure that it's actually going to wanna to start. Now, for instance, if you go and find an engine that's been sitting for 20 or 30 years, hasn't been running, the owner of the car has passed away, you don't know what sort of condition it's in, a really good starting method is to turn it over by hand just to make sure that the engine's actually gonna crank. So this will give a really good indication as to what the internals are like. Now, unless something has happened quite significantly, so it's run out of oil, it's been run dry, it's seized, it's got a hole in the side of the block because a Conrad's punched its way out, there is um, open to uh, the atmosphere and it's allowed water to get in, debris, all that sort of stuff. The first and easiest thing to do is just grab yourself a spanner, a shifter, a socket, whatever, put it on the crankshaft and try and turn the engine. If you cannot turn the engine by hand and it is taking all of your mites to be able to get it to move, do not waste your time. In our case, I know that this engine is gonna turn over quite easily because I've finished rebuilding it and everything is fully lubricated. So if you can't turn it over using something like this, a ratchet for instance, or even just a breaker bar, do not even waste your time. Okay, so all we're gonna do is just put a socket on the crankshaft pulley and we're just gonna give it a couple of good turns. Now what you wanna be feeling for here is resistance. The resistance of the camshaft opening and closing the valves as well as the compression of the cylinders. So if you turn it over and it is very easy to turn over, you'll probably find, for instance, all the spark plugs have been taken out or you have no compression in the cylinders. So step number two, what I would do next is to check all of the fluid levels. Now, I've already filled this up with some engine oil. I don't know where it is at the moment because I'm just a blind bat, but I've put high grade mineral oil in it, a 2560. Mineral oil is great to not only run in, but also help keep the longevity of the engine. They contain a lot of minerals, obviously, inside the oil that is gonna help protect it and help it to last a lot longer than any sort of semi or even full synthetic oil. There is a whole debate about what's better, synthetic, semi-synthetic, mineral, whatever, turpentine, I don't know, whatever you guys wanna use, and that's for another video. But if you are going to start rebuilding an engine, I would highly recommend starting with a mineral oil, and then if you wanted to, change to a full synthetic. Once you have gone from a mineral to a full synthetic, you cannot go backwards without doing damage or even risking damage to the internals of the engine. So you wanna be checking the engine oil level. So pulling the dipstick tube out and having a look, making sure there's oil in there. If there's no oil in there, keep topping it up until it's full. You also wanna check things like your power steering fluid, your coolant as well. The washer bottle, it's not so much because it's not gonna help the engine to run any better. 
check out those sort of things and when possible, get them changed as early as you possibly can. This is gonna help prolong the life of the engine. Not only that, but you may look at the service sticker sitting up on the dash and it said that it was last changed in 1992 and you look at the oil and think, hey, that actually looks quite clean. You know what, it probably does because it has been sitting for so long. But you start to turn that engine over and if it's not lubricating and cleaning the internals like engine oil is supposed to do, you're gonna have a bad time. Now one thing that kind of annoys me is that when you see on videos like Roadkill Garage for instance, as much as I love those guys, I do really not like the fact that they just start up an engine and then just run it with the engine oil. Now they probably have enough money to not worry about it and they can just throw a big block Chevy in there for you know 600 bucks and make a thousand horsepower. Whereas it's taken me many, many weeks and months to to build this and several thousands of dollars, I cannot risk running this engine on cheap canola oil. So I've got some really good high quality oil. So if you're gonna do anything next, make sure it is change the engine oil. All right, step number three is gonna be checking for spark. So what I generally like to do is disconnect the lead from the ignition coil straight to the distributor, which goes directly here, crank the engine and see if we get a spark. Now, it is not gonna start with this lead disconnected, so this is a perfect time to be able to check it. What you wanna be doing is pulling it off, either putting a screwdriver down in there that has an insulated handle, and then putting it to a steel surface or directly to the edge of another metal surface, that way the spark can jump from there. So how an ignition coil works is it is energized and then switched, which then collapses the magnetic field inside, which then generates a spark. So you have heap of windings inside the coil. As those get energized, it creates a magnetic field. It is then switched by the negative, I believe, which then collapses the field, which then generates a spark, bringing it out through here, through the distributor, to the rotor button, to each of the cylinders, to the spark plugs, creating the explosion, which then makes the engine go. So a really good way to know is if it's good, is if you have one similar or exactly the same, swap it out and just see if it works in your car. If it works, perfect. If it doesn't, get a new one. I can see a bird sitting on a whirly bird going around in circles because it is windy outside. It's probably the funniest thing I've seen all day. Now, you probably noticed that Grace is back in the workshop. She won't be here for much longer, simply because I'm gonna be doing some work before we get ready for the Ralston Classic in a couple of months. Now, back to work. All right, so step number four that I like to check is fuel. So we wanna be checking the fuel system. If it's been sitting for quite some time, it's probably got some really, really shitty old stale fuel in there, which probably won't cause it to start. So without pulling the fuel tank apart, flushing the fuel tank, replacing all the lines, and getting everything going, you can do a really simple fix here. So what you do is grab yourself a jerry can or even just a bottle, put some fuel in it, run a fuel line to the fuel inlet of the carburetor, for instance, if it is a carby. If it's not, you may need to run a high pressure pump depending on the setup that you've got. But because this is just a low pressure system, we probably could run the inline fuel pump, but it's not really necessary. Because the engine's only gonna be idling really, we don't need a lot of revs through there, nor do we need a lot of pressure. All right, so the next thing you wanna be doing is checking out the fuel system. So making sure that the carburetor is moving, all of the linkages are actually moving properly, and that the dash pot has oil in it. If it doesn't, grab yourself a little bit of ATF and just pour it in there, making sure that you don't overfill it. Once everything is moving fine, we can then run a dummy fuel line to, I think it's here, um, from a jerry can or even just a bottle of Coke that we've emptied and put some fuel in it. Once you've done that, you should be able to get it started. Worst case scenario, you can use a bit of carby cleaner or even a bit of start your bastard to put it down in there to get the engine to start kicking over. Sometimes it will take a little bit of time for the fuel to come out from the bottle or the jerry can that you're using through the fuel pipe, fill up the carburetor bowl and then push it through to the inlet manifold. Now this carby does need to be rebuilt, so I'm hoping that we can get it running just long enough for it to start kick over properly and bed the camshaft in. If not, then we're gonna to have to spend a couple hundred bucks and get it rebuilt. I can rebuild it myself, but we also probably need to get it sandblasted or even soda blasted to help clean it right up because it does have some really old debris on there. It would look quite nice if we got a brand new one, but brand new ones are upwards of a thousand dollars. So step number five is to check to see if there's any restrictions with the inlet system. So you wanna be checking all the way from the air filter all the way through to the engine itself. So things like a blocked air filter or even a rat's nest build up in the air box can cause the engine to not start. Heck, there might even be, and I've seen this once before, a plastic bag caught in the air intake system. So you wanna make sure that everything is completely free, 
moving and that air is actually able to flow. Going back to the three things that I spoke about earlier on, we have air, fuel and spark. Without those three things, an engine is not gonna be able to run. So making sure that the air intake system from the engine air filter sitting right here, all the way through the engine, are completely open and not blocked is going to enable the engine to help start at a lot easier pace. All right, step number six. Last thing you wanna be doing is making sure that it not only turns over by hand, but also you bring a fully charged battery and or a portable jump starter. Now this will enable the vehicle to start depending the sort of situation that it's in. You probably find the battery that's been sitting there for 100 years is definitely not gonna start it. Therefore, you're gonna have to scrap that one anyway and use a new one. You don't wanna have to drive there with one car and run the risk that you take the battery out and go to start it, you drain the battery and then you can't restart your car because you've just drained the battery out of it. So bringing both a new battery or a fully charged battery at least with a jump is going to help you to start the vehicle. Now you're probably wondering how do we start a vehicle like this? It is quite simple. All we need is power and earth. So earth will be the engine block. You want to apply it to a bolt or a component that is directly bolted to a main part of the engine block itself. If the car has a starter solenoid, even better. That's going to give us a better chance to be able to run it without having to touch 14 different things at once, shake your left leg and do the hokey pokey. Now, I don't have a starter solenoid on this at the moment, but it is in its way. So you want to be applying power to two different things. One is going to be the starter motor, but that's only going to be temporary. You only need the starter motor to work to start the engine. Once it's running, it doesn't need to be powered anymore. The second thing is the ignition coil. We need to put a consistent current to the coil that will need constant power at all times for it to work properly. Now how it gets triggered is via the earth, which is this one here, comes directly from the distributor, which open and closes the magnetic field, which then causes it to collapse, which then generates a spark, which then goes through to the spark plugs, leads, everything else. And last but not least, step number seven. One thing I was always taught by my mentor when I was an apprentice was, Whenever you start an engine for the first time, crank it until you have engine oil pressure. Now this is crucial that you do this upon starting a freshly rebuilt engine or even an engine that hasn't run for many years. The reason for this is all of the oil is going to be dripping down to the bottom of the sump and there's not gonna be any oil built up from the bottom of the pump all the way through to the cylinder head itself. So you fire it up and it's all running well. It all sounds great, you're super excited, you're getting your mates to film it, you're running it, you're checking everything, everything's all good, you've got your cooling system going, there's no leaks, you're holding the revs at about two grand to help wear in the camshaft, and then before you know it, it starts to slow down, and then it stops, and you can't turn over my hand. That is simply because it doesn't have oil pressure built up in the system. So like you saw in the previous video down below, I primed the engine oil pump with Vaseline. That'll help create the vacuum and also help to generate the pressure to be applied throughout the entire system from the oil pump. Also, Vaseline will help dissipate when it starts to melt and therefore it'll just become part of the engine oil until it gets flushed. So it's not gonna do any damage. Now, because this has an electronic oil pressure gauge, it is gonna be quite simple for us to do. All we need to run is a wire from here to a gauge, crank it over and make sure that we start to see that gauge move. Now an electronic method is really good, but you can never go wrong with a standard old school oil pressure gauge connected. Now for the first time, I would definitely recommend removing all of the spark plugs along with the leads. That'll help the engine to crank over quicker and faster, therefore generating more oil pressure a lot sooner. If you're gonna be cranking over with the spark plugs in there at the same time, you're gonna find it's gonna be taking a long time for it to build up that oil pressure. Now, the reason for that is it is going through the cycles, the inlet compression power and exhaust strokes. So it is slowing it down. You are sucking a lot of juice from the battery through the starter motor to try and get this thing to fire. So you just wanna make sure that for the first time, you remove the spark plug so it has zero compression and it's gonna start up nice and easy. Well, that's it for today's episode. You're probably a bit disappointed as to why I didn't start it. There are a couple of reasons behind it, simply because I need another set of jumper cables because mine are fried. I don't have a charged battery for it. I need a bracket for the alternator. I need to get the carburetor working properly. I'm waiting for some oil to come. I need to make a fuel line. There's a couple of things that I really need to do before I get this engine started, but don't worry. You'll see it right here on another episode of Tomo's Tune-Ups.